Well, let me welcome to the program, Father Wade Menezes. Father Wade, thank you so much for taking time to be with me today to talk about your new book, Catholic Essentials. Oh, you're most welcome, Tom. It's great to be here with you today and all there at Sacred Heart Radio. And uh, thank you for helping to promote the book. We've gotten a, a great response about it so far. Why do you think uh, you've had such a good response? Because I think it presents really, as the title indicates, the essentials of the faith, right? Uh, 81 chapters, short chapters, no one chapters over four to four and a half pages. Uh, most of them are around three to three and a half pages. Um, 81 chapters under five parent categories, Tom, morals, dogma, ecclesiology, the study of the church, the sacraments, and liturgy. And I like to consider this book, Catholic Essentials, Tom, which I'm holding up here as uh, uh, the, the one-two punch, if you will, in a good way, the one-two punch as to the why of the church's teaching on that particular doctrine of the 81 doctrines that are presented in the book in the 81 chapters. You know, a lot of people, Catholic and non-Catholic, Tom, know what the church teaches, Catholics themselves, non-Catholics, like our Protestant brothers and sisters, for example, uh, even our non-Christian brothers and sisters, like our Muslim brothers and sisters. Everybody seems to know what the church teaches, but very few can articulate the why, okay? And so I like to think of this book, Catholic Essentials, as the one-two punch as to the why. In, in a short, curt, uh, yet um, uh, loaded way, where I'm presenting the entirety of the doctrine uh, so that we can become better apologists of the faith and better educators of the faith. Amen. I love that, Father Father Wade. So as you uh, felt this call to put together this book and came up with these different um, short chapters, um, yeah. a number of things jumped out at me. You started with morals, and yeah. in there you cover a wide variety of topics, you know, the gifts of the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit, the works of mercy, on and on and on. Why did you start there? Well, we're moral beings as human persons. That said, that answers the question you just asked, is why, why start with morals? Why start with morality? Because we're moral. What sets us apart from the brute animals? What sets us apart from the gases and the airs, the rocks and the minerals, uh, the vegetative plants and, and flowers and crops? Um, what sets us apart is that we're made in God's image and likeness, okay? We're, we're a body-soul composite. We don't have bodies. We are bodies, and we don't have souls as human persons, human beings. We don't have souls. We are souls, okay? This is a teaching from St. Thomas Aquinas, okay? We don't have bodies. We are bodies. We don't have souls. We are souls. That's how intimate and intricate, Tom, the body-soul compositeness is in the innate dignity of the human person. St. Thomas also goes so far as to say, look at it this way, where the angels are non-embodied spirits, the human person is an embodied spirit, okay? So this is what sets us apart. Now, when you look at those, those two components of the human person, the body, soul, compositeness of the human person, as number 1803 of the Catechism says in its definition of virtue and virtuous living, virtue and virtuous living is the pursuance of the good, the true, and the beautiful in concrete daily actions with what? with all five of the bodily senses, sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing, and the four primary faculties of the soul, namely intellect, will, memory, and imagination. These nine great gifts that are illustrative of the body, soul, compositeness of the human person. This is what sets the human person apart as the only creature in the created corporeal world made in God's image and likeness. And so again, the gases in the airs, the rocks and the minerals, the vegetative plants, the brute animals, they might tell us something about God, and indeed they do because they're part of his creation, but we are a moral creature and the only creature in the created corporeal world made in God's image and likeness. You know, you look at the you look at the the the, the beautiful rock formation in the desert mountains of Arizona, as beautiful as they are, they're immense. They're so large and tall and very little vegetative growth on them. And they're just beautiful, beautiful desert mountains. As beautiful as they are, they tell us something about God, but they're not made in God's image and likeness, right? Uh, think of the fresh cut flower industry, all the varieties of fresh cut flowers. Y you name the flower, it's there, you know? 
uh, the, the whole variety, the cactus family, for example, the, the, the blooming family, everything. Uh, they tell us something about God, St. Thomas Aquinas teaches, but they're not made in his image and likeness. And how about the greatness of, of the brood animals? Like, think of all the different dog breeds and, and, and cats and horses and, and cattle. You know, none of the brood animals are made in God's image and likeness. Although I think cats think they are, okay, but, uh, <laughs> but they're not. Okay, I want to make that I want to make that clear. Cats think they are, but they're not. Okay, actually, I love cats. Cats are all right. But anyway, uh, my point is here. Why did I start with morals? Because we are set apart. That's why. And then why the other four parent categories of dogma, ecclesiology, and sacraments and liturgy for the formation of the whole human person. The five parent categories with the 81 individual chapters falling underneath them. So Father Menezes, I love that. You sound like a systematic theologian. It was very clear, very ordered. There's a lot well, of mercy there, Father. <laughs> a lot of mercy there, Father. I really like that you're a father of mercy and you're showing it to us. Now you lead with mercy. And I was thinking, okay, I see what you're doing here, leading with mercy, but you talk about the 12 works of mercy. Here's my question. Uh, among all of these works of mercy, whether the corporal or spiritual works of mercy, which one do you think is most needed to be manifest and demonstrated by the church today? That's a great question. And uh, dare I say it's a trick question because precisely, <laughs> it's precisely There's really no wrong answer here, Father. You can you can gotta go anywhere you want with that. You're gonna and you're gonna get it right. So well, precisely as a father of mercy, I want to um, stress that. The, the 14 works of mercy, which again show what? They show the illustrator, the illustrative reality of the body soul compositeness of the human person. Seven of the 14 are the corporal works of mercy from the Latin corpus, meaning body. And then seven, the other seven, uh, are called the spiritual works of mercy because they pertain to the soul. So this is a great follow-up question to what we just said. Um, in fact, I want to show something here in a moment uh, to our listeners, be sure, be sure to go to fathersofmercy.com. And there's a wonderful, wonderful examination of conscience brochure that's PDF ready to print off on your home printer. One complete side are the major tenets of Catholic Christian doctrine right out of the universal catechism, which lists incidentally on this side of the brochure, the four, the four panel brochure, uh, the 14 works of mercy, the corporal for the body, the, the spiritual for the soul, the 14 works of mercy collectively. And on the other side, the, the first three panels here, here, and here, comb through the Ten Commandments with a series of questions to help inspire the person to make a, a good, holy, reverent confession. And the last panel on that side, number four, is a little primer of how to go to confession. Maybe it's been a while since the person's gone to confession. But why do I show this now in answering this question? Because it's a great follow-up question to what I just said about the body, soul, compositeness of the human person, because the 14 works of mercy address seven and seven the body soul reality of the person in this day and age now to answer your question specifically i would say especially as an itinerant missionary preacher the spiritual works of mercy especially need to be promoted and promulgated today and I, hopefully my book will do that uh, what are the 14 works of mercy uh, in general i want to begin now with the, the the spiritual works of mercy for the soul to admonish the sinner. That doesn't mean in a mean way. It means in a very merciful way, because you don't want them to continue in their error, okay? You don't want them to continue in, in an erroneous conscience, for example, a conscience that's an error, the opposite of a conscience that's rightly formed, because they may be sincerely ignorant that they're sinning, and that has to be taken into account. But to admonish the sinner, to instruct the ignorant, to counsel the doubtful, to comfort the sorrowful, to bear wrongs patiently, to forgive all injuries, and to pray for the living and the dead. We offer suffrages uh, upon the person's death, uh, giving them to the mercy of God even after they've died. Now, I'd say those in this day and age, especially with the secular humanistic culture in which we live, are especially important, Tom, to answer your question directly. But the Father of Mercy in me doesn't want to do away with the corporal works of mercy, which are just as important. So I want to say those as well. Uh, to feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, to clothe the naked and visit the imprisoned, to shelter the homeless and to visit the sick and to bury the dead. 
Okay. So these 14 works of mercy are a great blueprint throughout the entire liturgical year, but especially during Lent mm -hmm. and especially during Advent. If a person, and I state this in the book, let's say you're having trouble coming up with some, uh, some positives to do during Lent, because we tend to think of Lent as doing the negative, doing negatives. I'm going to give up this. I'm going to give up that. I'm going to, I do it every year. I give up cauliflower and I give up green peas for Lent every year. Okay? <laughs> right? And I'm very heroic. Hey, I'm at least you didn't heroic. say I give up giving up things. All right. At least you didn't do that. All right. Right. So th that's what I mean by a negative. We're going to give up something. That's gonna, well, what about doing something for Lent? In other words, in the positive for Lent. So you want a blueprint of what to do for Lent. Here's your 14 works of mercy. The other blueprint for Lent and, and Advent uh, are the three eminent good works, which also have their own chapter in the book. The three eminent good works. What are they? Prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. So I'd say as an itinerant preacher in my line of work, there's a special emphasis in the Fathers of Mercy preaching apostolate on the spiritual works of mercy, but that by no means negates the reality of the, of the corporal works of mercy. That's uh, Father Wade Manesis, who's with me today. And I, I just, if you're watching this uh, video, you'll see his page for his book on sophiainstitute.com. Sophia Institute Press is publishing his wonderful book, Catholic Essentials, A Guide to Understanding Key Church Teachings. You can go right to the page. It's right here on sophiainstitute.com, which is the book for the press itself. Lots of amazing books here. It's a wonderful publisher. I love to support them. And I'm loving having you on today, Father Manesis. Uh, and again, I encourage you, you can go here and you can get the book as a paperback or as an ebook, which is immediately downloadable and usable by you. Again, sophiainstitute.com if you're listening on the radio. And you'll be able to find, if you could just go into the search button at the top, type in Father Wade's name, and you'll find the book very easily. Now, Father Wade, to be honest, okay, I'm going to show you a little, I'm going to admonish, not quite the center here, but ask for one. You gave me 14. You narrowed it to seven. You expanded to 14 again. I'm going to go after one. I'm going to say, uh, you, uh, it's sometimes called comfort the sorrowful or comfort the disturbed. In my own work in, in the church, I find a lot of people disturbed, whether they're disturbed at what's happening in the church itself, what's happening in the broader community, or what's happening in their own home, especially if they have teenagers or kids that are impacted by something that's a very dark thing, not your book, but this smartphone, which is making people very unintelligent, and it becomes a, a source of tremendous darkness entering their lives, and they're very disturbed. They're disturbed about their sexual identity. They're disturbed about their sense of who God is. They're disturbed about their sense of, do I belong? Where do I belong? To whom do I belong? It, it, it strikes me that it's a tremendous act of mercy to bring to bear the church's spiritual good to comfort the disturbed. Uh, what do you think about that? I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And this is why it's precisely a work of mercy, quote, end quote. You know how I define mercy? Let me tell you. Mercy is who God is. It's love's second name. God is more interested, Tom, in our future than in our past. Huh? He's more interested in the kind of person we can yet become than in the kind of person we used to be back in our past. While indeed taking our sins seriously, no doubt, whether mortal or venial, God never, ever, ever takes those sins as the last word. Why? Because he knows he's made us in his image and likeness, which we've already discussed. He knows he calls us constantly to himself with the life of his sanctifying grace. And he knows he is our God, who is bigger than any sin we might ever, ever commit, even the most hideous and wicked mortal sin. He's bigger than that. But we have to be there willing to receive his mercy. And as the three most recent popes have told us so very well, the receiving of mercy is predicated upon the acknowledgement of the reality of sin. So whether they're sorrowful or they're, um, they're disturbed, being disturbed, is on their own account through a sinful life or through objectively speaking, what they see a loved one going through or what they see the world going through with increased violence. We have to acknowledge God's mercy, yes, call that mercy into our life, but first acknowledge the reality of sin. 
we can, we can um, shout down how the violence has increased in this country as long as we want, as loud as we want. But if we do so without acknowledging the reality of sin, which comes first in order to be able to call upon God's mercy, we're not going to get anywhere. We have to acknowledge sin in our own lives. We have to acknowledge sin, objectively speaking, not subjectively speaking, in the loved one's life that we see going down a path, because we know what the church teaches. And if they're going against that, what scripture, tradition, and the magisterium teach, we want to help them save their soul. We want to call them back. That said, we're judging in that case objectively, precisely because we know the truth. We're not judging subjectively. But we have to acknowledge sin, and the same in the world around us. We have to acknowledge that sin is in the world, but Christ has overcome sin, and he offers us the Father's mercy. This is why I love so much the fact that our Lord reveals to St. Faustina the title of confession as the sacrament of penance as a tribunal of mercy. A tribunal is a court, Tom. We think of the marriage tribunal of the diocese. It's a court that judges. That's what a tribunal is. And, and our Lord's telling St. Faustina that holy confession, one of the two sacraments of healing and one of the seven sacraments total, is the tribunal of mercy. It's a court of mercy. Okay. So who's the tribune? Who's, who's the tribune running the tribunal? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Who was the tribune during our Lord's time when he walked the earth? The tribune was the one sanctioned by the Roman government to defend the guilty party, what we would call today in the United States, the modern day public defender, who's assigned to the guilty party, even free of charge, okay, by the county, and defends the guilty party free of charge. Our Lord's your tribune. He's my tribune. He's everyone's tribune in the sacrament and tribunal of mercy confession. Who's the just judge in the tribunal of mercy? Who's the just judge? Every tribunal has a judge. It's the father, his heavenly father. And the father and I are one, he tells us in scripture. And then I like to think of the Holy Spirit uh, as a juror in the jury box off to the side, you know, uh, being there present to guide everybody present in the truth of love and in the truth of mercy. So whether the sorrowful reality or the disturbed reality of the individual comes from within the individual, comes from without the individual because they're sorrowing or disturbed at, a, at another person, another loved one, or a, a leader or whatever, or whether they're sorrowful or disturbed at the world. The fact is two things, God's mercy and the reality of sin. In fact, God's mercy is predicated on the reality of sin. Because if there's no such thing as sin, Tom, guess what? There's no such thing as a need for mercy. But precisely because there is such a thing as sin, there is such a need for a thing as mercy. And that's, that's the important message to get out. You know, Father Menezes, what you just shared today, and you're, you're so kind to come and give us some time today to talk about your new book, Catholic Essentials. Again, folks, if you're listening to the program, I encourage you to go to sophiainstitute.com. You'll be able to look up his book, Catholic Essentials, a guide to understanding key church teachings. And I'm sharing my screen so folks will see that um, and be able to get a link right to this important book. Father, what you just said at the end there is actually quite astonishing, which is you talked about mercy as the second name of God, as a, as a way of expressing God's love. It, but it's a love we wouldn't know had we not sinned. It, which is such a mysterious thing to stop and think, I get to experience a particular manifestation of God's love only when I have betrayed him, when I've failed to follow his love, I've failed to honor his love. That, it, it, when, and, and especially when, when we do something like sin, we're becoming hateful to ourselves. We experience the hateful quality of sin. And so the last thing that we consider ourselves is to be lovable. And so to... In that condition where we hate ourselves, despise ourselves, feel disgusted about ourselves, all of a sudden the Lord is saying, I want to open up to you my heart and I want to encompass you. I want to immerse you in a love that says, I'm not relating to you based on that action. I'm relating to you on who you are in my eyes. That is so amazing. That's so amazing. Um, but Father, I want to say this. <clears throat> I want to say this. Uh, St. John Paul II said something like, and you're going to correct me on it, but I want to apply it to your life, not to the Pope's life. He said something like, the reason why God made me the Pope was because of the message of divine mercy, that it was because of 
his own connection to St. Faustina and the message of divine mercy, that that was somehow integral to him being called to be Pope. I want to say to you, do you ever sense that part of the reason the Lord called you to be a priest and a religious, to be a father of mercy, was in part connected to manifesting this second name of God and manifesting what he was sharing to the world through St. Faustina? As a father of mercy, uh, yes, but but there's never been a particular um, uh, revelation to me about that. My, my goal has always to just be simply a faithful priest who does not want to give his own teachings, his own agenda, but rather springboard from the Bride of Christ, Holy Mother Church, which he left in his stead from his Ascension Thursday till he comes again to act in his stead as his bride which we know through her four marks, one holy, Catholic, and apostolic, which we profess the truths of, of this bride in the creed every Sunday at Mass with some 40-plus truths and 12 articles. Um, th that's been heavier for me, is to just be able to, to, to simply give the truth to people in a, in a pure, unadulterated manner that's, in, that's done in a balanced way, neither too far right nor too far left. Our goal isn't to be too far left or too far right. Our goal is to be right in line with the chair of Peter. Uh, virtue is found in the means. So insofar as that message is a message of mercy, because God loves us so much, yes, I would answer yes to your question. But in a, in a particular way, uh, per se, I would have to say the greater revelation to me has been wanting just to be able to give the truth. Again, in its pure, unadulterated fashion, just as the church teaches it, uh, as our baptism calls us to live it, as our confirmation calls us to live it, uh, sustained by regular Eucharist and regular confession. And this, whether one be in holy orders or in marriage, the sacrament of matrimony, or single in the world, or through widowhood, single in the world, uh, be able to live our, our Vatican II confirmation mandates and our Vatican II baptismal mandates, that, that every baptized Christian is called to give to the other the great message of salvation in Jesus Christ. That's from the, the Vatican Council's decree on the missionary activity in the church. And from the document on the laity, especially for the laity, not the clerics, but the laity, upon all Christians rests the noble obligation to give the message of salvation to all brought about in Jesus Christ. Um, Father Menezes, I gotta say, you're really good at this. <laughs> You are very articulate. You're very clear. It's very organized. I love it. You're like the easiest guest I've ever had. It's it's so, this is wonderful. You got a gift. Uh, and folks that are listening on Sacred Heart Radio, you know from EWTN, when you get to listen to the programming or you watch them, you're very familiar with Father Menezes. And folks, if you're listening, especially if you're a man and you're in Northern Idaho, you're in Eastern Washington, or in the sounding, uh, within the hearing of this, Father Menezes is coming out to lead a men's retreat uh, in Coeur d'Alene, uh, coming up in the uh, middle of October. I'll give more information about that after the interview. You don't want to miss the opportunity to spend a weekend with Father Menezes uh, and to be able to really bask in and, and really soak in this amazing teaching. But today we're talking about Catholic Essentials, a guide to understanding key church teachings, his new book published by Sophia Institute Press. Father, you mentioned there, these, oh, you want to, you, you want to, you have something more to say here? Go. Yeah, I, I do. I, I'd like to just comb through some of the chapters, some of the 81 chapters that have really oh, yeah. resonated with people that I've been hearing back from via email or voicemails or letters. Some of the things that have really resonated with the different different individuals about the book. So uh, I'm going to give 16 or 17 different uh, of the chapter titles that that fall under either morals or dogma or ecclesiology or sacraments or liturgy. But these are some of the ones that have really resonated with individuals. The importance of a rightly formed conscience and how that is achieved. For example, not only on a continuum, but especially during voting season, right? Uh, the importance of making an annual spiritual retreat, whether single or married or widowed or, or a consecrated religious or a diocesan priest, the importance of an annual spiritual retreat. Uh, the difference between mortal sin and venial sin. Uh, the theology of the body in the day and age of transgender ideology, uh, the seven capital sins and their opposite corresponding capital virtues, 
Uh, why is it wrong, morally illicit, for a man and woman to live together before marriage? Uh, the harmony of faith and reason, the human soul and its immortality, God's mercy and the end times, superstition, the Antichrist, the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell, three of which will apply to each one of us personally, death, judgment, heaven, or hell. Huh? Uh, the baptismal priesthood versus the ministerial priesthood, one of my favorite topics, how the two priesthoods differ. One's a sacrament, one isn't, okay? Uh, but yet both partake in the threefold office of Christ as priest, prophet, and king. Uh, the doctrine of transubstantiation, especially during this three-year Eucharistic revival, right, called for by our bishops from uh, Corpus Christi 2002, this past June, through Corpus Christi of 2025. Uh, worship and veneration and how they differ. We give worship to God, but we give veneration to the angels and saints. The proper placement of the tabernacle inside of a church building. What's the church's preferred hierarchy for the placement of the tabernacle? That's a big one, okay? Uh, the benefits of making a frequent confession. And by that, I mean once a month. So these are just some of the topics, Tom, that I think that that, that I know <laughs> by, by what I've received in the feedback, some of the chapters that have really resonated with individuals. That's awesome. I, uh, I'm not surprised. Uh, folks, if you're listening or watching this interview, uh, his book, Catholic Essentials, is it's very accessible, but that doesn't mean that it isn't profound. Um, what Father shares in the book is very succinct, but it's also very profound. And I, I very much enjoyed the short format. These answers rely uh, a lot on not only um, what Father Manesis has, has uh, combed through his own study, but referencing the catechism on almost every on almost every one of the chapters, the scriptures, and also Fathers of the Church and quotes yeah. from popes and the magisterium. Uh, it really, Father, you did a wonderful job of, of making succinct um condense you know dense dense but succinct presentations of these topics you know, i have I, a question which chapter sure. did you like the uh which chap which chapter or which sec section did you enjoy writing the most and which one was the hardest oh that's a difficult question tom uh that's a curveball man that's a curveball question <laughs> I, I i well i gave you two you sides know, so you can answer one and then I, hey look i i know you're going to dance your way around any one of these so you're going to say they're all difficult i i love i love <laughs> writing i guess it's my journalism background i love writing i love researching the church's teachings i love the saints and the fathers uh, by the way, it's funny that you just mentioned that about the, the scripture quotes in the church, fathers and saints, because every one of the 81 chapters begins right after the title of the chapter, the, which names the doctrine that we're going to look at now. Right after that title of the doctrine, the title of the chapter comes a scripture quote and a church father or saint quote that sets the, the theme for that particular chapter to embolden that chapter's teaching by the church. And that's something that's resonated with people. They love the fact that each chapter kicks off with a scripture quote and a, a church father or saint quote that's pertinent to that particular topic that, that's then being read. Um, I'd have to say that I, I love the sacraments and liturgy very, very much as a priest. They're dear to my heart. I'd have to say that as far as enjoyable goes, uh, I really enjoyed writing the chapters under sacraments and liturgy. Uh, I can honestly say that none of them were too difficult to write. Uh, I love the faith. I love reading about the faith. I love the universal catechism. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm host of EWTN Global Catholic Radio's Open Line Tuesday every week. So that's a fast paced call in show, as the title uh, insinuates, Open Line Tuesday. So Open Line means a, a call in, fast paced show where the individual asks questions. So I, I do this weekly and answer the questions. And um, not that I don't have my sources at my fingertips, often I do, but praise God, most of the time I'm able to just give the, the one-two punch on Open Line Tuesday as well. So it, nothing was really too difficult of putting the book together, but it was, it was time consuming. I do some of my best writing between 3.30 and 5.30 in the morning. Uh, I'm an early riser. Uh, that's some of my best quiet time and my best, most focused time, especially with my travels and my preaching on the road. Um, so yeah, I would say that that uh, I, I particularly love sacraments and liturgy, and that uh, everything had a concerted effort for all five parent categories and all eighty-one chapters had a, had the same concerted effort to put together a good product. 
Well, I can I ask a question about the the section on liturgy. So sure. I um, I really was struck by what you shared about reverence in the liturgy, and that's a big theme these days. Lots and lots of folks, especially with the rise of the traditional Latin Mass, and and people are are one of the reasons that people tend to move towards that is around the theme of reverence. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the fundamental place that reverence has in the sacred liturgy. Well, reverence comes from the word meaning to revere, to give honor to, even to give glory to if it's God. And that's with exactly what we're doing in the sacred liturgy, the celebration of any of the seven sacraments, in a par excellence kind of way, the celebration of the Eucharist. Um, we're giving glory to God, we're giving reverence to God, we're giving adoration to God. So reverence is all a part of this reality. So from the Ars Celebrandi of the priest celebrant, which is the Latin phrase for the art of celebration, you know, from, from reverent movements to beautiful vestments to beautiful sacred vessels, everything that's worthy of glory and adoration and reverence toward God, to um, proper decorum by the congregational members in the pews, uh, beautiful dress, uh, you know, receiving Holy Communion in a state of grace, not knowledgeable of any mortal sin on your soul, receiving reverently on the tongue or receiving very reverently in the hand by making a true Eucharistic throne with one complete palm open over the other complete open palm and the audible amen for the ordinary form of the mass, the body of Christ, amen. Some people ask me, Tom, what is the greatest liturgical abuse I see today? And I answer them quite honestly, the greatest liturgical abuse, the inaudible amen or the non-audible amen, the body of Christ. Amen. You can't, you can't even, yeah, you can't even hear the person. You, you can barely see them move their lips. Yeah. I would say that the, that it, amen is, is Hebrew for so be it, the body of Christ. In other words, this isn't ordinary bread. This isn't ordinary wine. It's, it's the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. Amen, so be it, I believe. Uh, more appropriately, it means, it means I believe in an exclamatory fashion. You know, I, I believe. And so this is an act of faith on the part of the recipient of Holy Communion when the, Holy, when, when the, when the priest distributes the sacred species. Um, it's an act of faith on the part of the individual recipient to make that act of faith, because that's precisely what it is, and make the audible amen to, to say the audible amen. But, it, you know, from dress to decorum, and not only on the priest's part, and, but also on the congregation's part, and not only on the congregation's part, but also on the priest's part, lectors, acolytes, servers, um, lectors dressing appropriately, reading the word beautifully in preparation for the proclamation of the gospel that we're about to hear, slight pauses in between the readings to, to, just, to just gain in, in intellect what we just heard proclaimed. These are all elements of that. Uh, the Eucharistic fast, make sure that you've fast of the Eucharistic hour, no gum in church. Uh, with the exception of medication and water, we need to practice a true Eucharistic fast of one hour before reception. Um, so all these things come into play in the reality of reverence. Mm -hmm. So Father, last question. You wrote the book, Catholic Essentials, A Guide to Understanding Key Church Teachings, Sophia Institute Press. I'll share information at, after the end of our interview, Father. Um, when popes talked about, I think it was Pius XII, talked about ages of decay versus renewal in the church were marked by decay or renewal in dogma, morals, and liturgy. And these are the three of the pillars of what you write about in Catholic Essentials. As you think about this moment in the life of the church and what's at stake in it, a moment of decay versus renewal, how do you see uh, those three dimensions playing out in helping to foster renewal and avoid further decay? Well, first of all, let me say this. It's no secret that the church in her 2000 year history has gone under particular trials and tribulations in 500 year intervals. So in the first 500 years, we had the great Christological and Gnostic heresies, uh, namely against Christ and the Holy Spirit. Uh, around the year 1000, uh, 1054 or so, we had the great split between East and West, not so much over doctrine, but more over jurisdiction, huh? uh, uh, Constantinople versus Rome. Uh, 15, at around 1500, 500 years after that, we had the Protestant Reformation. And now in the 2000s, we have uh, the great heresies of secular humanism and relativism. And I, I like to sum up 
and I'll do it now in a very short, pithy way, how we've gotten to the point we are today, okay? And, and, I, and, and this isn't the full story, what I'm about to say. By no means is it the full story, but it kind of sets the foundation of why we are where we are today, uh, especially in a post-rationalist age, okay? And it's five politicos or five philosophers that I'll mention here. Here we go. Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, the French philosopher, he emphasized human freedom, but denied human morality. Sigmund Freud stressed human instinct, but he suppressed the reality of the spiritual side or the spiritual aspect of the human person. Friedrich Nietzsche glorified the individual, but disdained the community. In fact, one of his more famous quotes is, hell is other people. Well, that doesn't sound, that doesn't sound too very other-centered, does it? It sounds very self-centered, right? And we live in a culture today that's very self-centered. Karl Marx, the founder of communism, Tom, did the opposite. He celebrated the community, but rejected the individual and individual rights, okay? And then Charles Darwin, and rightly so, was greatly enamored with empirical science, but he excluded the reality of metaphysics. That is in part how we've gotten to where we are today. And it by, again, by no means do these five individuals, these political philosophers uh, are the cause of the whole problem, but a lot of this has infiltrated the church, okay? Uh, especially since the close of the Second Vatican Council. Not to blame Vatican II. Vatican II is solid as a rock. Those 16 documents are beautiful, solid documents. Rather to blame progressive forces within the church that took the Vatican II ball and ran in the wrong direction with that ball. That's, that's where we went wrong, and that's why we've suffered for these 55 plus years. So how do we remedy it? I say we focus today on the innate dignity of the human person. Oh, and by the way, I wanna say this, I haven't really formulated this in depth, so I'm gonna say it in a very cursory way. I, I've thought about it during prayer. I've thought about it while driving to my parish missions and retreats and conferences. I've thought about it on the plane when flying somewhere for uh, during a three hour flight. And it's this, I've already mentioned how the church goes through particular trials and tribulations in 500 year intervals, right? Well, in the first 500 years, we have the great Christological age of heresy and the great Gnostic age of heresy, Gnostic meaning against the spirit. In one sense, those two heretical ages or stages were combined within the first five to 700 years. But the fact is they each attacked a specific divine person, the second person, the son, and the third divine person, the Holy Spirit. Now, today, 22 years into the third millennium, you know, all the human life issues, abortion, euthanasia, uh, unnatural marriage in its six major forms, um, how about transgender ideology? All these things really are an attack on creation, which make them an attack on the Father, the first person of the Most Holy Trinity. So I ask rhetorically, I ask rhetorically, once you've gone through three major heretical stages or three major heretical ages that attack all three divine persons of the Most Holy Trinity, what's left but the second coming of Christ? I'm not claiming to know when the second coming of Christ is. I have no idea. No one knows the day nor the hour. Even our Lord himself says he does not know the day nor the hour. It is the Father to know and the Father to inform the Son. So I'm not claiming anything. All I'm doing is positing a rhetorical questions. We've had the great Christological age of heresy, the great Gnostic age of heresy, and now we've got the great heresies against creation, which are against the Father. So, so that's something to ponder. But I think we need to get things back on track by talking about the innate dignity of the human person, the body soul composite, the greatness we're called to, the pursuance of the good, the true and the beautiful in concrete daily actions with all five of the bodily senses and the four faculties of the soul, etc. This is the message we got to get out that everybody is unique, precious and unrepeatable to quote John Paul II. And I'm hoping that by drawing people to the truths, the beautiful truths of our one holy Catholic and apostolic faith, People will be moved to live better lives, to pursue that virtue and virtuous living, to become better Christians, to become better, better Catholics. That's Father Wade Manises joining me today. Father, that was beautiful what you just shared. Uh, I, you got me thinking a lot about the uh, five political philo philosophical influences and, and the way that they're playing themselves out. It's so important. Ideas have consequences. And so Father Manises is in his wonderful book, Catholic Essentials, A Guide to Understanding Key Church Teachings, is providing 81 short chapters, short but dense, 
and uh, really uh, will help you to grow and nurture your own Catholic faith. Father, you've gone even long today, and I really appreciate your willingness to stay on a little bit longer than expected. Sure, let's do with it. Us. I really let's appreciate it. it. <laughs> Thank you. So, Father, um, I you mentioned something about um, the age of the father, the attack against the father. And um, one of the things John Paul II said, I, I love your insight into this, because you talk about faith, hope, and love. He highlighted uh, a particular way of understanding the fall, that you can historically look at the fall as an act of pride or disobedience. But John Paul II highlights it as an act of mistrust. It's an act of mistrust that we don't trust the father because we have a master slave understanding in our mindset rather than a father. And that's, uh, you know, the idea of um, unlimited trust and entrustment to God is all about faith. And that's really what this book is about. So as a father of mercy, I'd love for you to reflect for a moment on John Paul II's insight about this as an age of the father, especially associated with mercy and overcoming the mistrust of the fall. You know, St. Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It is God's will that you be saved. It is not God's will that you be reprobated, a nice way of saying damned, right? But it is, it, it, it is God's will that you be saved. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That fear there is a filial fear, not a servile fear. A servile fear is a fear of a punishment coming uh, to the underling by the superior for having done something wrong. That's a servile fear. That's not the kind of fear, Tom, that we're supposed to have of God, the Father. We're supposed to have a filial fear from the Latin filius, which means son, literally, or colloquially, it means child or son or daughter. We're to have a filial fear of God, which means a fear, I love this, a fear of not wanting to disappoint the parent. Why? Not because a punishment's coming if we do disappoint the parent. Uh -uh, it has nothing to do with punishment. Rather, filial fear is the fear of disappointment, the fear of disappointing, precisely because the child knows that the father loves him. He loves him. That's why the child doesn't want to disappoint. And so I would say, to answer your question, we need to foster in our daily walk of faith, our daily spiritual life, a filial fear of God and not a servile fear of God. For example, a lot of people who had a hellacious relationship with their father mm -hmm. have a very, very poor image of the father in heaven. Um, one lady came up to me after a parish mission. She says, don't forget the mothers. And I says, well, what do you mean about that? And she, although I think I knew she, what she meant, but I wanted her to express it. I was shaking people's hands as they were leaving, thanking them for coming to the mission. And she says, don't forget about the mothers. She says, father, I'll tell you, I had a bad relationship with my mother. It's taken me decades to understand the Blessed Mother's role in the church because I've always had a block between me and my devotion to the Blessed Mother because of my own relationship with my own mother. So it can work both ways. We need, we need a fear of not wanting to disappoint, not a fear of a punishment. So a filial fear over a servile fear. And this is important, again, for our daily spiritual walk, um, our daily faith walk. Uh, our journey to heaven. And again, work out your salvation. It is God's will that you be saved. One other thing too, Tom, that I might say, if I may, about the book is, is uh, first of all, the dedication page. Uh, it's very clear. I wrote it for three, three individual groups, and I want to say what those groups are right now. Uh, it's important, I think. Uh, for all who practice their Catholic faith with great fervor, for the lukewarm, and for those who have abandoned it, may you soon return. So the fervent, the lukewarm, and those who have abandoned their faith, may they soon return. And then also, I want to talk about, if I may, uh, who, who are the main audiences for the book beyond the dedication? This is very important. So I wrote the book for apologetical reading for Catholics to become better Catholics in defending and articulating the faith, apologetically speaking. So apologetical reading. Number two, educational reading for all people, Catholic and non-Catholic, just to become better educated in the why of the church's teaching. Again, the one-two punches to the why. 
Number three, spiritual reading for all, Catholics and non. Let's say you take a, a weekly holy hour at your local parish's perpetual Eucharistic adoration chapel where our Lord's exposed in the monstrance. Take this book with you. Read two or three short chapters each hour each week when you go make your Eucharistic holy hour and, and ponder the truths of the faith. So apologetical reading, educational reading, spiritual reading. How about for directors of religious education in parishes, what are called DREs, who are the ones working with the new catechumens who will be entering into the church at the Easter vigil? Make this a supplemental text, if not the main text, for your catechumenate to learn more about the truths of the faith and the why as to the truths. Also, Catholic high schools, especially juniors and seniors in Catholic high schools, who within a year to two years will be going off and entering the world into the real world, whether through a workforce or through higher education to better prepare them. And then also for book of the club months at parishes, let's say that the men's group at the parish meets every Wednesday morning at 6.30 for an hour and a half till eight o'clock before they drive off and go to their work. Um, they could assign each other particular chapters. And then on that Wednesday morning over coffee and donuts, talk about those two or three chapters that the entire group read this past week. And, and tall, I didn't know that. I didn't know that's why the church taught this or that about this particular topic. So book of the month clubs uh, as well. So uh, again, apologetical reading, educational reading, spiritual reading, DREs, directors of religious education, Catholic high schools, and book of the month clubs. Those are the top five, but there's other, uh, other audiences as well. Well, it's uh, interesting. Father Manises here talking today about your book, Catholic Essentials. And folks, I've been showing you the screen. If you're here online watching this video, I do encourage you to go to sophiainstitute.com, sophiainstitute.com. You can just type up in the search bar the name of the book, Catholic Essentials. It'll pop right up. Uh, Father Manises, uh, this book is, uh, I found it, one of the most valuable things I found about the book is I'm, I'm looking for books to put into people's hands that they're not going to just set aside. And one of the big things that stops them is it's daunting. It's too big. And your chapters are, again, we talked about them as succinct and dense, but they're, um, I want to say this, they're easy to read. Like you're easy to listen to. You're very clear. Folks, if if you're enjoying Father Manises in this interview, it's like that in the book. It's very clear the way that it's well-ordered. And I, I have to say this, that um, the catechetical, the apologetic, the educational, it's the spiritual nourishment. I really found that, again, especially in the first parts of the book, but even dogma leads to devotion, dogma informs devotion, and you go on from there. The last section on, on liturgy, it, in, it helps stir spiritual growth. I think that's a... Um, that's going to be a, um, a lasting fruit from this book, Father, honestly, is the spiritual nourishment it will bring because it's accessible. Well, I appreciate that. And that, that is one of my main reasons why I wanted to keep the, cha the chapters short and succinct. Again, no one chapter, Tom, is over, is over four and a half pages. I think there's one or two chapters that might go into a fifth page, but that is it. Everything else is four and a half pages or less. Quick read of a chapter in just 10 minutes. Right. And you think about it for lots of folks when, they're, when they have their own personal prayer time, as they're growing in their use of their prayer time, they're looking for something to say, what can I take from 20 minutes to 30 minutes or 30 to 45? Have the book by your side and you can include, right. in addition to a devotion, take and read a section of this book. It's called Mental Prayer. Mental Prayer often involves reflecting on a spiritual text, a theological text. And your book, Catholic Essentials, really is, um, I, I believe it's already serving that purpose, but it will more and more. So thank you for doing this. You're very welcome, Tom. Uh, and I want to invite your, your listeners at Sacred Heart Radio uh, to listen in to Open Line Tuesday, uh, every Tuesday at 2 o'clock Central Time, which is 12 o'clock Pacific Time, uh, and call in with a question on Open Line Tuesday. I would love to take their call. Try to uh, see if you can trip him up, okay? Because I was not able to. I, I got a curveball. I didn't get a knuckleball in, Father. So uh, <laughs> we'll we'll see. I'll, maybe I'll call and I'll change my voice on Tuesday and ask a hard question. So <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> well, that's Father Wade Manises, a Father of Mercy, today joining me on the program. I really appreciate the time and generosity you've given to us, Father. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Tom. It's been great to be with you today. Thank you so much.